Okay, why don't we, uh, why don't we get started? Um, if everybody could have a seat, we'll get started. So I want to welcome everybody to our day-long uh, workshop or uncommon dialogue, as we call it over on the other side of campus. And my name is Bruce Kane, and I'm director of the Bill Lane Center for the American West. We are co-sponsors of this uh, Uncommon Dialogue along with the Sean Parker Center and uh, we, uh, Carrie Nato and uh, Mary Pernicki, who Mary's here, Carrie's coming later, uh, have been instrumental in us thinking about the architecture of this event. So uh, the motivation of this, I'll say just a few words about that uh, and uh, then I will introduce uh, Phil. The motivation of this comes from a program that we've started about four or five years ago, uh, thanks to the generosity of the Eccles family, who also regularly participate in the program. We have something called the Eccles Rural, Rural West Program, Eccles Family. And the idea of that was to get Stanford out of the bubble and out into uh, areas of the West, and to be able to work with stakeholders and academics from other institutions to create a network and to figure out where Stanford can make a contribution uh, in the region as a partner, as a sponsor, etc. And as we were doing this and moving from Montana to New Mexico and Washington uh, and Oregon, we were discovering common themes and one of the most important themes that came up over and over again was the state of health in the West. And the relationship between the environment and the economy as it relates to health as well. And some of it is in the newspapers and came out in the 2016 election, but we saw it long before that election. Namely, uh, people that were not living healthy lifestyles, not even exercising in the beautiful places that they were at, but even more seriously, of course, the opioid and uh, crisis, the drug crisis in the rural areas, first meth and now uh, opioids. So we, no we noticed all that <coughs> and we listened, especially the first couple of these meetings, but then gradually we started to think, well, what could we do that was more constructive than just listening? You have to start with listening. You have to be responsive to people that have problems. And, uh, and that's what led us in the most recent one uh, in New Mexico to actually look at some best practices that were um, in operation in the states that we were visiting and to start to think about, well, what could we do that either is in that spirit or uh, presents a different kind of innovation that we could introduce. So that was really sort of the motivation and then we pulled in because it is about healthier rural west. Uh, we had Phil really directing this, uh, I'll introduce Phil in a minute, but his background in the medicine uh, was very useful, but we then brought in uh, Carrie Nado and uh, Mary uh, Pernicki into, uh, into conversation about what we could go do going forward. Now, to be fair, what you discover both at Stanford and around the West is there are parts, so to speak. There's a, a, a series of programs here and elsewhere that you could imagine are working on very similar kinds of topics, perhaps in different countries or in different contexts, but you could imagine that there's, that there's some relationship that could be pulled together in a more, co more coherent way at Stanford. And the question is always whether you leave things as the sum of the parts or whether you create a whole. And if you do create a whole, why are you creating a whole? And I think in the backdrop of the discussion today is to think about, well, do we leave things as the sum of the parts or do we do something more coherently going forward? Um, and I think the other theme is it should go in the fashion that I think Stanford wants to go or the direction Stanford wants to go, which is to stay with the sort of notion of an interdisciplinary approach to problems and not simply consider health problems to be the med school's problems, but to bring in the social sciences, to bring in bioengineering, to bring in civil and environmental engineering because this theme that health is not just uh, at the back end where you're taking care of people when they're sick, but also in the front end when you're trying to create a healthier environment. And this is a theme that I think Phil will talk a lot about, okay? So, um, what I think we're gonna do 
now is we're going to, I, I want to introduce Phil. Phil's going to make a presentation. We're also going to show a video that'll take us up to approximately the nine o'clock spot when our speakers from our first panel hopefully will arrive and we'll get started. I'm going to be sitting and taking notes and thinking uh, as we go through the day, I'll be here the whole time, except for occasional jaunts outside to use the men's room, uh, and try to pull all of this together in some way that we can have a discussion about it, okay? So, um, in the end, I think we, we do want to talk about steps forward, and so hopefully at the end enough people will be around to have a discussion, but if not, we'll convene another meeting and do that. I don't know. Uh, so let me introduce Phil Polakoff. Uh, he's an affiliated scholar with the Bill Lane Center. He's also a consulting professor at the Stanford Med School. He's the uh, CEO and host of uh, A Healthier Me. When I first heard it, by the way, I thought, because both Phil and David Kennedy have knee problems when we walk, I thought it was a healthier knee, but it turns out to be a healthier me, uh, which is uh, the knee of which is part of it anyway. Um, he is the author of five books and 200 articles, over 200 articles, and uh, he has even more advanced degrees than I have. He's got, by my count, at least four uh, from a lot of different institutions, including UC Berkeley, where I used to be a professor. So he's got as broad a background as anybody, to, and so therefore he's very good at thinking about the big vision that ties the environment, that ties public health and ties medicine together. So with that, Phil, can you kick it off for us? Good morning. It's really a great pleasure being here today. It's an honor to be here. I've been in this room before, and hopefully we'll take this room and make it come to life. And also, it's been an interesting last week. Um, for those who've heard of it, you may want to go once in your life. For those who haven't heard of it, who knows? I was in Davos all week and presenting on global health and then flew in here late last night. That wasn't the challenge. 22 hours is a bit long for transportation. We're on a mission. I'm on a personal mission. Mine goes back to being a 60s activist. I applaud Bruce and I applaud David for creating such a great institute. I'm challenging Stanford to be what it is, which is truly one of the great universities, but even be more in this space. Um, I honor Hope Eccles for all she's done, and Randy, who is her significant other, who is a gracious guy but wouldn't be on film with me. So I remember that. Hope, you remember that? See? And then I'm honored that the Secretary of Health from New Mexico is here, Lynn, who I put in the aura spot. The younger table, and our new associate, Ben and Fred, and all of you are in here. And you'll see the work of our videographer here, not the Stanford group. Glad shortly. So it's a, this is a team effort. It's not once or two. It's all about us, not me. Um, healthier me sounds nice, sells in the market, but as far as these efforts, they're all a collective effort. And in some ways, as I show you this presentation, if I'm given a clicker, do I have to stand behind the podium to do it, or can I? Thank you. I just like talking from the floor. Part of that's because of my size. Standing behind the podium is good. And wait a second, since you're here, this is the one going yep. forward? Yes, it is. OK. So um, this is available. Hopefully, you'll get it one way or the other. It can be emailed to you. And uh, for the women in the group, because like Justin Trudeau, I have accepted myself as a feminist. So I'm part of the feminist movement. And usually, I change my name from Phil Polakoff to Philippa. Okay, so as I'm presenting, see me as Philippa uh, and our woman. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And interesting, this is 1948. This is not 2018. And keep in mind, the UN will celebrate its 75th anniversary in San Francisco in two years. And when I was in Davos, we created a new vision. It's not a reality that may come to the end in testimony to it, I'm wearing my newest pin. The newest pin stands for the 17 Sustainable Developmental Goals of what the UN enacted in September of 19, uh, 2016. All the ones you know, but you should look at them if you haven't. 
It could be hunger, it could be women, it could be education, it could be climate, it goes on and on. It could be poverty. And in essence, some of that's what we're going to talk about, about the rural West. Different politics, but not much of a different issue. Ownership, power. Um, did I miss one here? Okay. So in essence, a tale of America's role of healthcare. It is the best of times. There's no question we've had some great advances in technology. There's no question we've had new pharmaceuticals at work. The question is to whom, when, and at what cost. So what are we going to do with these great advances? It's the worst of times. State of public health, except for the leadership in the state of New Mexico, is pathetic. And it's not perfect in New Mexico, so she'll on it. The last time I was on a call with Lynn, <laughs> great call. We won't go into the political part, but we'll go in. I said, so Lynn, where are you? She says, I'm on the border. I said, the border, OK. And what are we doing? I'm dealing with opiates. And I can't unite the different issues. I got uh, law and order. I got mental health. I got the medical community. I got the community people. And I can't pull it all together. And we have a national emergency, and there's no national guidance. And the CDC is someplace ill-defined. And I got to make something happen for the common person. So let's get on with it. So I thought that was an incredible call with where she, and she said, I'm coming here, and she won't tell you. She was supposed to be in legislative oversight now in New Mexico today, but she thought this was equally as important, so she did both. So we got a lot to do, and we got to integrate, and that's where Stanford can play a major role. There's no shortage of intelligence here, no shortage of interest in technology. And for any of you who haven't heard, all week long, I was caught up with one new word that I didn't know about two months ago. Tell me, how many of you are an authority on blockchain? Come on, we have no authorities at Stanford on blockchain? Well, that's all Davos was about. You know more about it in the form of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the front end of blockchain. And that's all they're talking about the worldwide. Do away with the banking as a middle level. And this is what they define as the fourth international revolution. So it takes the internet and puts it in a different space. Now, I'm not saying you have to buy in or buy out. I went to Davos with a zero liking for blockchain. Now I'm probably 25%, 30%. They did convince me enough that I can't stay out of it. And it's going to affect the other part of your life. The, the Federal Reserve is going to hear a lot about blockchain. I'll tell you, it's there. It's not running away. Whether it's all real or not, hype or not, but it's going to affect the entire financial transaction. So blockchain is when David and I, I send David $10 at his request. David receives my $10, but it doesn't go through the banking structure. You got that? Where's my $10? For you. For you, since I'm indebted to you, you'll get it. Since I got, I got a bill for you from Vietnam, I was just there. Um, so. When we look at America's rural healthcare landscape, critical issues, innovative solutions, we got an aging population, we got evolving payment models, we got emerging technologies, we got comparison transparency, what's for real, what isn't for real. We got state budget crisis. Lynn, you have no issue with this one, state budget crisis. Everything's perfect. You got so much money, you don't know what to do with it. Uh, workforce challenges, how are, we going to get, how are we going to get more females into the workforce at jobs that have meaning and empowerment? Regulatory environment, David's the authority on this one for years and years at the highest level. Consumerism, how are we looked at as not only a patient, but we're also a consumer, and more importantly, we're a person. So sometimes we're forgotten about. We're seen, as Bruce alluded to it, as it's all about treating at the end stage. Keep in mind, most of the money spent in healthcare is at the beginning and at the end. Problem with children, prenatal children, at the end, living not with dignity, but living maybe too long and how you transfer to the higher space. Uh, and quest for value. And is there a way that we can really put empowerment behind uh, pay for performance? And maybe rather than talking about single payer at this point, the best is Medicare for more. So we can get it with a more definition on the triple aim, better health, better care at a fair cost. So this, I think, is very profound. This is from a Muslim a scholar who presented it to me shortly before. When I is replaced with we, even illness becomes wellness. And with this, if we work together, we can get to a healthier rural America in a better way. And that would mean trying to bring an interconnection between places like Stanford, places like Robert Wood Johnson, places like the Secretary of Health from the state of New Mexico, 
places like faith, community, and the health providers, and try to find ways where we can interact. And where best can we start all this project? In the state of Utah with the Eccles, because that's a great state to start out. That's not a joke. There's actually some sincerity on that statement. Uh, so with this, this is what I call Phil Polikoff PP and his five Ps. Place, we have to recognize that not every place is the same. There's different cultures in one part of Utah from another. Salt Lake City is not the same as rural or Ogden. Same thing in New Mexico. You've got Albuquerque, which is a tour de force in size for that state. But it's different than up in the places up past Taos in the beautiful country up there. So you have to do it in the other place. Personal health, that's how we deal with us as individuals. And in this generation of millennials, there's certainly a lot of meism because they have a different way of thinking. I have two millennials as children, and we really work at basic communications. Because what you're thinking is, we have a couple in the room. Welcome. Hi, you're smiling. Thank you. I have to smile and listen. And that's all I do, listen. Don't comment. But I did shave the hairs off my nose, because I was told when I perform today, I can't have any of the hair on my nose. <laughs> they told that it's critically important. Population health. We got lots of different populations out there, public health, and last, political will, because somehow we're stuck between this side and this side. And I think the senator from Colorado, Michael Bennett, had a great line. Let's move from the past to the future and forget it against red and blue. It's taking up way too much energy. And couldn't we collaborate, commitment, and have commitments and make progress? So it's a different world. When we define the rural west, <clears throat> it's basically out there. You can see the populations. There is several definitions of where the rural west starts. Um, I guess, Bruce, what's it? The 42nd uh, meridian or something? What? The 100th? Yeah. OK, let's be correct. The 100th meridian is there. But you can see the different states have different uh, people are categorized in rural, with Montana being the highest. California being the lowest, but this is there. And it represents 20% almost of the US population. And keep in mind, there's rural on the East Coast too, but it's very different because they don't have quite the distances when it comes to even healthcare. So Appalachia is a different model um, than what's out in California. But uh, Kentucky is a rural state with the coal. Keep in mind, if you ask the people there what they think about Obamacare, they hated it. What they thought about health insurance exchange, they loved it. They were one and the same, but how it was perceived and the story wasn't told. Out here, I think most of the red states would have thought that with the change of administration, their health status would be better. And I think if they're honest now, their hope and their desire is still a work in progress. So with this, the three Wests, the metropolitan is the urban areas like Denver, Albuquerque would consider to be metropolitan. Interconnected, as you can see, is different. That's more in the places around the urban areas and then isolated. And these are the people who are getting hit the hardest. They're older, slow population growth, job problems, less education, higher accident rates, and likewise. With this, the disparities are due to <coughs> geography, demographics, social economics. And you can see these for yourselves, and you're welcome to get a copy of this. Observe greater rates of unhealthy behaviors in the isolated rural West, uninsured individuals suffering from life-threatening injuries. And we'll see that. So when you look at these, I think you can all see them. Rural West tend to be poor on average. Rural West are likely to have uh, less insurance coverage. They're about to have more. They're in numbers, they have fewer accidents, but they're more significant and survival is much less because they can't get to the place, there's no one monitoring it, and also there's a higher rate of DOIs in the rural west because there's no speed limit. So this is a real challenge. Uh, <clears throat> with that, you also have suicide rates are higher amongst rural men, and actually it's growing significantly amongst rural women, and we have an, a major opioid addiction spreading out throughout the rural west, which isn't being handled yet. There's no mental health services there, and there are no doctors in this area. So they have 20% of the population and only 10% of the providers. And that's a real, real problem. Life expectancy isn't like. And when you look at metrics, there's a lot of numbers, and they talk about big data. Let's simplify it. If we concentrate on three words, we have most of the metrics. And Lynn, you can challenge me on this. We deal with mortality, 
morbidity, and functionality. And if we can increase the quality of life and patient satisfaction and person satisfaction, if we can <clears throat> enhance the role of uh, less morbidity, and then the mortality rates would be helped significantly. So rural elements are more likely than urban counterparts to be overweight, not as physically active, don't have access to a lot of quality foods. And as we all know, food does play a major issue, especially in the obes obesity epidemic. So we eat more nutritious food that we can have less pesticides on it and make sure if there's chewing involved in it, then we'd be better off. And ab abuse of alcohol and smoking likewise. Higher prevalence of lung disease, which Mary and others will talk about today, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and all sorts of increase in death rates associated with coronary vascular disease. And they don't seem to do as well when they do have a myocardial infarction. So in summary, we already talked about not enough physicians. And I wouldn't say in the future, a lot of care, which I hope for, will become from community health workers. And we heard that in Santa Fe, that this is a force in the community to get people engaged in with healthier lifestyles and take on behavioral issues. Uh, we need to increase the transportation opportunities to get a person who's four hours away from a, a tertiary center of excellence to help them. Medicare payments to rural physicians has to be appropriate as well as to hospitals. Many, many places with care are closing down in rural America. So the amount of rural hospitals is almost becoming mythology. Um, with that, you can see all the influencers, health behaviors, clinical care, and I think on the physical environment, we left water on that slide, which has to be done. Education, employment and income, family and social support, community safety issues. So getting there, and I think this is part of our mission for today, is we really have to think broadly about the factors that influence health. And I think Bruce alluded to that in his conversation, that most people talk about health care and illness. They don't talk care about health. In our society, how many of you are really active in preventive health? And is good. And is your insurance covering it at all? Or are you paying out of your pocket? That's, that's great, and we'd like to hear more from you during the day about that. And yourself, does your insurance pay for your uh, preventive activities? Uh, yes, is yours? What? Yes. Okay, and yours? No. Not much, I need to switch to her insurance. <laughs> uh, okay, okay, but so you're, you're, you're in, the, in the mainstream, hers is the exception. Uh, assess needs and resources. So what we're trying to do, and this is a challenge I said to Lynn, what are we getting from all the different efforts. And I said, the University of Wisconsin, some of the back of this deck, which you'll see when you get it, talks about all the research they've done on rural health issues and changing. But it's really important. You have to assess the needs and research. What you, where you've been, where you're at, and where you're going, who's involved. Focus on what's most important so you get a game changer out of it. What can you do that's here today that you can act on? Research is critically important. I have my dialogues, having some academic background, and it's, now that I touch upon that, what's challenged me in my own personal life is that I had the good fortune to have my first degree was in agriculture. And you talk about ironic stories. I majored in rural sociology. So out of the blue, and I think it's because of Bruce and David, and I don't know how they got my name, they asked me to give the keynote speech at the Rural Sociology Summit this year in Portland on rural health. Came out of the blue. So then my second degree was in environmental engineering. My third degree was in medicine. My fourth degree was in public health. And what we're talking about is all of them. So it's sort of, for the first time in my life, there's a holistic mission. And then part of it is the global issue. So how do you take that and take what we've learned here and extend it to other places around the world, but also bring in their stories into our world and make it? Because sometimes the people in global health at academic universities think the world's outside of the US. But guess, half these issues are here in East Palo Alto. You don't have to run away from them. It's here at home and have we dealt with them. So that's a challenge. Choose the right policy and programs for your community. Engage a variety of stakeholders. So all of you are part of that group of new stakeholders or old stakeholders or a combination of where we're going. And communicate, which I am a great believer in. And that's why all of you have to be heard 
on your story today so we can find the best in the pearls of where we've been, where we're at, and where we're going. And yes, I feel sometimes I'm an insider at Stanford and sometimes I'm an outsider, but on the world scene, having the title of consulting professor was legitimate branding. So I applaud you and thank you for that. Um, with this, this is sort of an action slide. Work together, what we have to do, it's a little intense, but it sort of culminates all the different players in there and who we have to involve in trying to seek out change. Key issues in transferring America's rural health, transition organizational funds and capabilities to move from volume to value, because sometimes we're paid for volume at a medical center. How many patients are you seeing with X, Y, and Z? And really, sometimes it's not what the value of the interaction is. Lowering costs with improving quality, it's pretty expensive. Average person in the United States pays about $9,000 a year. As a single person, it's about $14,000. We're definitely number one in the world for costs. And guess what? We're about 14th or 15th on quality. So our numbers don't look so good. And uh, when you go, it turns out that our doctors are paid in general, specialists, specialists, a lot more. I met a very young, aggressive surgeon from Berlin yesterday. He makes $120,000 a year. Salary and the cost of living is pretty high there. And here, that same person would be making a half a million dollars a year. So there's a, there's a wage compensation issue which has to be dealt with. New approaches to care delivery and patient relationships. We're going from patient-centric. Some people now think about village-centric. How do we make this so it's more people are involved in the case? Stakeholder alignment, leading and engaging stakeholders. So that's where we're in some ways here. Improving, let's look at what we can do. Invest in the foundation of lifelong physical and mental well-being in our youngest children. We really have to put more energy because that's our future, whether it's climate change, whether it's education, whether it's health, whatever it is, it has to be a higher priority. Create communities that foster health promoting behaviors and broaden health care to promote health outside of the medical system. And in New Mexico, we heard a great story, Lynn may touch upon it, about Cuban. Cuba, Mexico, and what they did to take health behaviors into the community and they developed ways of getting people more engaged. Primarily, they were Native Americans and Hispanics. They got people more engaged with their food and the lifestyle was in, enhanced and they won an award for this. So let me summarize. Going forward, we need innovation. We got to bring technology or telemedicine, which Jim Gibbons will approach into this thought. Leadership, it's got to be collective. It's got to be at different levels. We're not going to decentralize everything, but if everything's centralized, that's probably too heavy. And when I heard recently about we're in an era of polarization, we're in the area of populism, and we're in the era of power. And is that being disseminated enough to the people who are being asked to go to the voting box? Trust and transparency, quality of care, value proposition, financial strength. Can we get more for less? and collaboration, cooperation. So with that, I think my cousin would like to express himself. Logic will get you from A to B. Imagination will take you everywhere. And with this, I think we're on a mission. I'd love to hear your thoughts. We have a few minutes for Q&A. And put out what you think about a healthier, healthier rural West and better health care. So thank you very much. There are a lot of slides after this in the appendix, but they're not for here that you can look on, which drills a lot deeper into the issue of rural health. So thanks a lot, and let's keep on. Please come on in. Uh, any thoughts, concerns, ideas, bullet points from anyone? It's too quiet. I'll ask myself the question then, but we'll go. We'll turn to you first. Sure. And please introduce yourself. My name is Sophie Fidoni. I'm from the Stanford School of Medicine and I work with Dr. Abraham Rodriguez at the Washington Center for President about the art and science of human physician medicine. So I'm glad to see you and talk about patient relationships. There's two other relationships I think that are important, especially when it comes to delivering what we the voice, oh. just so we can Thank hear. you. There are two other relationships, I think, beyond the patient relationship that are important. Uh, one is the physician themselves. You know, we in our nation for the last three years, 50% of primary care and OBGYN physicians talk about burnout, suicide ideation, and wanted to leave the field. 
they're just as dissatisfied. Um, and they feel like the highest paid, um, you know, techs, tech people filling out their EHR rather than really doing patient care. So I would talk about the quadruple aim to include physician wellness beyond the triple aim. And the other thought is to actually include what we've been calling family, which are friends and family. As you point out, health starts in our schools, in our homes, in our workplace, and the clinical medical world isn't there. Our friends and family are there. So in our work, we've been talking about how to actually actively engage that family for the wellness and healing of all. And from a prevention perspective, preventing illness amongst those family folks who end up then having the burden, which ends up impacting their own health. Very well stated. Thank you. Would you like to add on to that commentary, since you don't have preventive medicine? Um, I'm Paul Wise, I'm professor at the Med School Health Policy and the Freeman Spogli Institute of International Studies. Um, I thought you pre presented a wonderful overview, and thank you for that. But if you had to identify the, dis the distinctive requirements of the communities at greatest risk, the communities of greatest concern in, in rural America, where would you focus? Um, where? Where do you see the distinctive requirements for new approaches and new strategies that could engage the variety of disciplines that we have in the room? When I had the pleasure of training overseas, you hit it right on the spot. Your question is better than any answer I can provide you, okay? Um, I think it's both a holistic and a point specific. So when we do the resource analysis, we can look at the data and we can find out where those have the highest rate of prenatal issues or the highest rate of uh, not dealing with the sequence of life to death, okay? We can take on where the obesity is rampant. Uh, I saw some movies that Robert Wood Johnson did that talked about the places in the Columbia River, which is a beautiful tourist area, but the people are in destitution when it comes to food, right? In New Mexico, Santa Fe, there's two, the tale of two cities in one city. Uh, I saw where the affluent lived and their lifestyle, and I saw where the poor lived and the communications between the two. And I'm not overly stepping my toe because Lynn can share that with you, and Lynn won't tell you who her husband is, who's ironic, they had some of my roots from New York. He's chief of police for the city of Santa Fe. And there's one street there called Airport Boulevard that separates this side of town to that. Stanford has a little of that even in this own environment here. And this is my second life at Stanford because 30 years ago I was assistant clinical professor here, right, of medicine, and now I'm consulting. So there's a great deal of energy here to answer your question, but I think it takes some discipline to have this broad vision and points of reality. I mean, here you could say East Palo Alto needs some hope, or places along the Pacific coast have had changes in culture. So that doesn't really answer your question, but it's a start that if we have a map, if we get the the uh, directors of public health, or whatever they call it, the state level. We bring in the intelligence here. We bring in the opportunity of communications. All I heard about is this fourth revolution in technology with blockchain. So wh where does that, where does Stanford fit on that? I'm sure some of your people are heavily involved in it. I don't know who they are, and the people in this audience don't even know. So things are moving very quickly, but the problems of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals are significant and how well a beautifully written document is actually brought into place is a dream of mine. So we're going to take it, whether it's education, poverty. And the best speaker I heard in Davos was the Minister of Women's Justice for Canada. And what I heard, why I stole the line is, Justin Trudeau has said he's a feminist now. And this woman was truly the very best speaker I've heard in the last couple of years. No BS, no grandiose. She just hit it right there. We have some issues that we need collaboration, commitment, and passion to make it happen. So it's doable. But we don't have to start up here. I can grandiose the issue. We have to start. Let's start on the bottom up and let's get out there and be, here's my bias, let's be a little bit more proactive 
and pro research in action. Because if you research something for five or six years and a person's got a problem today, they say, that's great, but what can you do to help me today? And I'll tell you one classic story. UC Berkeley School of Public Health did a very well-funded NCI product, uh, program in Richmond on smoking sensation. After five years, their numbers were a disaster. And when we went back and did focus groups with the people in Richmond, they said, we'd rather have the immediate pleasure of this being addicted to smoking than worry about lung cancer for 30 years. Make sense? Did I partially get to your question? Partially. Other thoughts, because we're, we're still on schedule, and then we gotta show you a short movie. Any other thoughts from the younger side of the table? I'm putting you on the spot. Come on. I'm getting you to laugh, smile. Any thoughts? You have to have a thought. No thoughts? What? <laughs> Say who you are first. Sure. Hi. Um, I'm Katie Dickerson. I'm a second year medical student here at Stanford. Um, and I lived in eastern Kentucky for many years. Um, and I'm interested in kind of this thing that you alluded to that part of the difference between the eastern west and the, the rural west, uh, or east, rural east and rural west, um, might be kind of the driving time to access for care. And that seems to me like a very low barrier for change because putting up emergency services um, might be something that's a big bang for your buck, particularly when you showed statistics about accidents and how many deaths that cause. Um, but that being said, I think, I mean, even in Eastern Kentucky, I was living in an area that was an hour and a half from any trauma center. Um, so when we look at kind of this overlap between the opioid crisis, smoking cessation, I mean, all, all these issues are the same. Uh, things that I were, was dealing with in Kentucky, too. Um, so I'm interested in how these populations are similar, but maybe also different. You're totally correct. I asked the governor, Brashear, and you were there probably when he was in power, not Bevins, mm -hmm. can't you have the people tell their stories? I couldn't get them to use the media to tell the stories. Why? I, can't, I couldn't get the Obama administration to do that either. Keep in mind how few people spoke about Obamacare except Obama. And keep in mind how the communications between Obama and Congress could have been a little more energized on this issue. And keep in mind that they could have done, uh, rather than replace and, you know, repeal and replace, they could do, let's refix in this second term. But I'm just, I'm not picking on you, David, because I hold you in great luster. I'm not taking on Obama. I just think there could have been more. No, this wasn't your space. But they could have done, and Sylvia was a great head of HHS. But they could have addressed some of the weaknesses rather than turn it over to the other side for their repeal and replace. So you're right on target, and thank you. Okay, well why don't we show our two minute video, three minute video, because this is sort of what we started with in Santa Fe for those who weren't there, a few of you have been there, some weren't there, and then we'll move on to our first panel. Very much, I'm sure most of you have other thoughts going forward now and you're on the move. However, before we get to that stage of departure, we want to share with you what you shared with us. And hopefully we can take the experience over the last two days and not say that this is the conclusion for today, but it's start for tomorrow. Well, I do think healthcare, which is the uh, subject of this conference, is uh, a critical issue. Communities uh, in any part of our state really can't survive and prosper without good health care services. The amazing thing about Earth's beauty is that as much as it erodes under human influence, it remains inexhaustible. There is great beauty even in abused landscapes. It is a good thing for all of us to dedicate some part of our life to the defense of Earth's beauty. If you believe in sort of the existentialist credo that through right action you create meaning, well, to act in defense of Earth's beauty is meaningful. I think from my perspective, the critical issue is the interrelationship between poverty 
and the life conditions that people have in the rural west. A quick response is quite difficult. Right now, we're seeing that a healthy rural west is more a dream than a reality. You're getting a feeling that there are more people who are committed to change. So there's a hope. I'm very excited about the potential. The people who presented were diverse, had differences of opinions, had a passion for commitment. Um, how much they're willing to step up to the plate and take a swing and said, I'm in, only time will tell. So in New Mexico in particular, access to care is pretty critical for us. We um, operate with a predominance of rural communities and um, having people not able to receive critical care um, at important times is something that we are challenged with. What generates a lot of excitement and faculty members like myself is watching students and residents say, aha, wait, I can do this. That broader perspective we teach is not just what happens in the state capitol or in Washington, D.C. It takes place right where they work. All of us ought to be concerned about water issues in the West. All of us ought to be concerned about uh, greater opportunities to uh, to exercise and take advantage of the amazing uh, geography in which we live. One of the things I keep hoping is that the Lane Center will become a resource. What the Lane Center does, what uh, what their staff do to put this on, and the people that come and participate, and the the amount of passion and interest is really rewarding. I think the the most important issue is the fact that the United States as a whole does not understand that there's a serious health problem in the rural west. We got plenty of policies. How do we execute and make the policies work better? That's an area where I think Stanford can help. Uh, there's typically not enough attention on execution. That's where we need help. That's where I think Stanford can lead. One thing we do at SAR, even though we're deeply rooted in the southwest and in northern New Mexico, is we try and find the best ideas and introduce them to scholars and practitioners from other parts of the world. So at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we're working with others throughout the country to build a national culture of health where everyone has the opportunity to live a healthier life. So it's our hope that this is the start of working towards a healthier rural west. history that some of you were involved in and today's the next stage of along the path to get to us where we are to answer what you folks have already alluded to. So that's the challenge. To get us started, I want to first introduce uh, you're part of the uh, team that we're trying to pull together to make some really dynamic and energized as we can get it. So with that, let's, uh, we can stand up for a second as we get ready for the next battle. Okay. Thank you.